yeah yes, yeah yeah you are visible and audible both yes yes oh, okay all right so um welcome all uh, to um the second webinar um of our series of webinars um around women in life conservation um today we have dia banerji speak about citizen science and conservation uh dia banerji i'll just do a quick introduction she's a wildlife activist and uh, conservationist uh with more than a decades experience um she has worked with uh, a number of top biologists of india and she has number uh, worked with a number of uh, forest communities forest dependent communities like uh, mongias parthis gonds tenchus and so on so some of the more significant things that she has part of is that uh, she has been part of uh, leopard conflict mitigation uh, in sanjay gandhi national park um, she has worked in tadoba she has worked in kawal um she has been featured even featured in forbes magazine for her work presently she uh, resides in uh, bengal uh, working on conservation issues there uh, and uh, we are very lucky to have her as a part of the team and as our advisor uh, so what we have to we now speak about how citizens can participate in uh, conservation related activities in particular through the emerging Activity of citizen science. I'm I'm sorry, Orko Prabhu, is is there a sound? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think that's better. Yeah, thank you so much, Orko. That was quite extensive. Uh, I would like to uh, rather introduce myself as a person who is obsessed and passionate about animals and the ecosystem. And uh, uh, I would also like to say that uh, uh, most of us are. uh you know should be because it's very uh, intensively uh, very selfish self if they are not around if the ecosystem is not around i think we are not around and uh, recently we have been uh, facing certain uh, you know reback uh, from uh, the from malaria disasters uh, i think we are getting a lot of lessons recently in that saying that uh, thanks to all for joining i know a lot of my very good friends from wildlife has also joined my family has joined thanks so much it really is very overwhelming and um, and i would like to uh, send my prayers to all the cyclone hit uh, sectors of bengal and people who have been uh, who are devastated by today's cyclone or has is safe from it so all my prayers to them so while we start this uh, uh you know webinar so just before i start i would like to say that you know i don't really want to you know keep on blabbering so let's make it interactive because as orko rightly said it is about how each one of us you know all of us in fact uh, i uh, uh, can contribute can be part of this whole uh, uh, you know saving of mother nature saving of ecosystem saving of whatever is left around us and uh, also the animals who are has the right to live right so uh, please feel free to unmute yourselves anytime you want to talk discuss and i really would love to know your opinions and that you know so let's just be a you know, monologue so let's have that session dialogue so great uh, very interesting you know like um uh you know a monologue so let that let so the uh, first thing we would like to really do is you know i would like to question you know that together let's do it together in fact uh, I, because i know this question generally hovers in minds of most of people that is uh, this and uh, interestingly i call it a million dollar question because uh, if i see myself 15 years um, uh, you know a go in fact i know i be, i was asking myself this question and that million dollar question is whether we you know people like us who are some of us who are not trained or certified in wildlife whether we can at all help uh, in wildlife conservation or saving the ecosystem or do we really you know can can we do something on, uh, on this in fact you know so this was always a million dollar question with me from my childhood <clears throat> and it is just not wildlife it all, all kinds of animals in fact and uh, with that uh, you know i uh, i mean 
I started my journey with that, in fact. So this, fa uh, this famous million dollar question, in fact, and the whole mystery around it, uh, where we always want to identify, want to try and do something, in fact. So uh, to do that, you know, very interestingly, we have to actually identify ourselves. So identifying ourselves or, you know, identifying our, us as a character. So let's name that character. And I want all of you to meet Pia. Pia is a, is a corporate person, is very passionate about nature and wildlife. Avid birder, travels only to wildlife reserves, you know, uh, to uh, quite a scornful way from his, her family, in fact takes part in all kinds of wildlife and ecology meets wherever she can go. Hates non-nature lovers. In fact, you know, she gets into fight very pretty regularly with them. At, at every opportunity, Priya loves to save birds, dogs, cats, snakes, you know, whatever. And most of the time, she brings all of them home. Again, under the scornful eyes of her family, in fact. And uh, so, you know, the neighbors feel that definitely she's very crazy in fact she cannot be normal because uh, because that's not how generally a girl of her of her age uh, deals with life in fact and uh, let me tell you uh, she's very very passionate to the extent that uh, she gets into regular fights so how many of you uh, you know just give me a shout how many of you recognize yourself as Pia okay I can see one hand how many of you really recognize yourself? Hello. Okay, I see a lot of hands coming. Wow. Okay, and please, sorry, uh, don't get into uh, Pia as a. Uh, I, I do recognize. Thank you so much, uh, and don't uh, just think that Pia is a, you know, only a female character. Uh, even Pia or Neil, we can be any one of them, right? So it's lo lovely to see so many hands coming up, in fact. So I think we are uh, addressing absolutely the right kind of audience. Yeah, and me too, let me tell you. I'm also one Pia out here, in fact. Great. So uh, welcome to all the Pias and the Deans out there. And I'm, I'm sure all of you in your lifetime always wanted to do much more than what you do now, in fact, right? I'm sure you all, uh, you know, already... You know, already uh, you know, save cats, save dogs, you know, try to feed them. You, at your own responsible ways, definitely do, I'm sure, definitely do many, much constructive work around, in fact. But sometimes you don't, I think you are sometimes in the edge when you very feel that maybe I can do more, right? So, uh, madam, just one more thing. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah, love for animals is not only restricted towards uh, dogs, cats, and uh, the wild animals. Even uh, animals like cows, buffaloes. Any animal, any yeah, animal, yeah, yeah. any animal. Absolutely. Because absolutely. unfortunately, then we are then we are judged on the kinds of animals you like. Uh, no, absolutely not. In fact, uh, do you? Uh, interestingly, there is something called urban wild also. You know, so there is a yes. wild wild. There is an urban wild also. So in urban wild, we actually get to see a lot of mongoose. We got to get to see. In fact, some of the stray. I call the stray dogs as urban wild. Because they yes, are yes. Cute. I mean, not those animals only who look cute. But no, no. <laughs> what, what? I think cows look very cute. I, I have a one cow standing in front of my house every day. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, like, uh, so let me tell you, let's uh, rephrase the whole statement by saying that anyone and everyone has a very constructive and fruitful role towards saving, you know, anything which has a life, right? Because that life has the equal rights to live like we, we do that, right? I think, will everyone agree to that statement? Agreed, agreed. Perfect, thank you very much. So then, uh, you know, then this whole question and the whole uh, edge where, you know, thinking that, okay, I'm in corporate, I do not have the training, I do not have the certification. Can I ever save the world in fact? You know what? Uh -huh. Uh, sorry, ma'am. I couldn't uh, just hear the statement that you made. There was one disturbance. Okay, no problem. So the statement is very simple. Uh, in fact, uh, Pranav, that is, you know, every one of us at one point of our lives, we always think whether we can at all without our any kind of formal certification or uh, degrees in wildlife biology okay. or anything can ever do anything for 
just not wildlife, saving any kind of animals, right? And let me tell you very interestingly, it is from my own experience, from many of my friends' experience who are all part of this, uh, some of them are part of this uh, uh, webinar. You can really, seriously, you can, in fact. Yeah, and totally there is, agree. There is nothing stopping you from doing what you can. And the extensive, uh, you know, uh, field for where you all can participate is, you know, mind boggling. And I would actually, uh, when I show some of the areas where, you know, all of us uh, coming from very normal backgrounds, me, myself, coming from very more normal backgrounds have actually done and contributed. It is absolutely overwhelming. And I would actually like all of you to even add to the list so that, you know, we also come to know how many other things we have missed, in fact. So let me see where all our footprints can be, you know, very, very constructive and very, very interesting, in fact. You know, wildlife tourism. Then birding, helping wildlife rescues, documenting issues impacting ecosystem like mining, road widening, tree felling in your areas, then documenting and your surrounding habitats. You know, it can be a very interesting habitat which you want to, would like to document. Then, you know, like making small groups to check on the endemic species found around you. Interestingly, in Bangalore, I'll give you an example. There is a, an area where you get a lot of slender loris. And there has been an amazing citizen science project just to document their habitats, their, uh, you know, their patterns, their ethology. You can even monitor uh, and protect wildlife. Do you know that? In fact, as just you know, non-wildlife person, in fact. And what else, you know, the list goes on, like wildlife activism, you know, you can actually voice your, uh, you know, strong opinions against certain, uh, you know, certain wrongdoings, like making a road inside a, a totally beautiful habitat and destroying that habitat itself, right? So then counting species in the wild when you are around, Propagating positive messages if you are uh, if you are in social media in where, which every one of us are propagating positive messages about the ecosystem about animals in social media participating in legal battles very interesting I wish uh, I hope uh, my one of my environmental lawyer joins with me but uh, she's in Calcutta but uh, let me see whether she joins we got we'll get to hear from her too then you know you can build such a beautiful network of wildlife enthusiasts which i have actually i have a very strong group and friends of wildlife enthusiasts and they are a very fun people let me tell you in fact then you can do conservation photography or videography you know you can pick up issues which you are seeing around and you can document them with photographs you can videograph it and send it to certain authorities express your views and lastly, but not the least, you can also donate. If you have really have an issue with time, you have a paucity of time, you have a very less bandwidth in terms of really going out and doing certain things, why don't you please donate and open your purses to different wildlife uh, you know, projects and causes. And let me tell you, most of the time, the projects and causes are not very well funded, you know, because most of the time nowadays, in fact, we are doing a lot of social funding, in fact, uh, you know, crowdsource funding, in fact. So any, anyone else who would like to uh, add to this list? Yes, yeah. uh, whether I don't know whether it fits into this, but mm -hmm. even uh, reducing the carbon footprint, I mean, you wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, Wonderful. Reducing the, the amount of things you use, mm -hmm. recycling all the plastic, first of all, segregating all the garbage. Wonderful. Recycling all the plastic. The, I know of an organization in the outskirts of Mumbai. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they, they collect all the plastics from certain uh, societies and areas mm -hmm. and put it into biofuel. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, actually sustained an entire uh, village on the biofuels because the Chula system, they have stopped it. and. Uh, they have mitigated this particular problem of plastics because there's a huge dumping ground near my place and that creates uh, havoc with the with the smell wonderful Can in fact thank something? you so much yeah in fact i'm sorry i actually missed this point so i wanted to mention it before starting this list itself 
so the uh, you know the charity begins at home everyone knows so the whole system begins at home you be using less plastic like you rightly said uh, or you know using uh, less uh, uh, fossil fuel is another or very degrade uh, non degradable resources like uh, like even the plastic toothbrush so nowadays i use bamboo to toothbrushes in fact for example in fact yeah and so, also and also sorry uh, also I, i forgot one more thing uh, yeah sure the, the kind of uh, chemicals you use to clean your houses i mean uh, mm. you know that the yamuna river mm -hmm. it cleaning by itself it's because of the domestic use of chemicals which is creating that froth mm -hmm. yamuna river ganga absolutely yeah that that's also one more very important thing we can clean our houses with uh, normal water also that's okay so uh, are you on uh, are you on uh, uh, you know video because i can't see you i mean i uh, know i actually <laughs> actually did <laughs> my video okay okay no problem yeah i'll i'll come i'll come on the video yeah just a minute sure 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 so while she, while he's on the video anyone else would like to add to this list anything which comes to your mind where you think we can have a positive footprint uh Uh, uh i think uh, okay. we should yes weta is yeah. that you hi ma'am yeah, yeah hi yeah uh hi everyone who's in this conference uh i just want to add something see we everybody knows that in some other way we can make a change mm -hmm. but the problem is like um, there are rules and regulations in place as well if you talk about the you know using of uh, wastage in the right way there is a rules and regulations in place but nobody is really keen in you know following those things yeah. i think um, uh, when as a common person when you even do it you know one person cannot make a difference what i feel at this stage what we are in so i think the government should take a strict action against these things and i think uh, rules and regulations are there in the paper but i think when it comes to practicality i think none of us are really contributing so even if you put a law in place what's the point it's just going to be black and white that's it i think in practicality we have to educate people i think spreading awareness is a great thing that you know uh, you know in that way i think we can make people understand because wonderful sweta they given the dry and wet waste mm -hmm. the two different buckets what is been given Absolutely. by the ghmc but Absolutely. nobody uses it i'll tell you what everybody common man does they'll say one for the next next time when the other one breaks <laughs> okay <laughs> so they really don't understand but you know sweta sometimes i feel uh, maybe you can add to it or others can add aware is an ex excellent way in, excellent uh, point which you raise in fact uh, maybe i missed it in the list uh, awareness can start at home itself by you know making people aware inside your family itself that how impactful it is to do this change and the second thing is sweta you know very interesting point that you make about the dry and wet waste so yeah. for a long time i have seen people in uh, shopping malls uh, mm -hmm. has shopping malls don't even understand what is a wet waste what is a dry waste yeah so it's very interesting you know like they think that okay if i throw the coke in wet waste which is mm -hmm. i think wet <laughs> then should i put the put the you know plastic cup in dry waste or should i put the coke and the plastic cup Bottle inside together. the wet waste <laughs> so so Right. So that's what where I feel is like you know when they're given the buckets, mm -hmm. so there should be some you know, uh, message. you know message that will be mm -hmm. given why we are doing that. Absolutely. Because if the dry waste will go to you know you know making you know uh, they can make electricity of that. Mm -hmm. To be very frank, I think the GHMC has got the mission spending crores and crores of money mm -hmm. to generate electricity from the waste. But when people are not aware. what are we going to do with the dry and wet waste nobody is going to really you know pay attention to that there are a lot of people who will be really willing to do it when they know the reason why they have given this absolutely i think i think that's a good point to make and uh, i hope we are going to uh, uh, do some uh, you know some something to uh, redo this whole mistake of it and i think let me tell you even as a single person we can make a small change however small the change is it is still very big impact you know because it's true each person uh, making uh, a change will make a bigger impact yes pranav so i have one query that 
how about if we impose uh, an additional charge if people don't uh, segregate their waste before disposing to the municipal corporation people so Will there is help? a lot of international uh, place in fact outside india abroad where they actually do that but uh, yeah i mean that's a point that's a point in fact because india i think if you put a charge uh, some people take some concerns on that right yeah Sorry, because i agree understand. to that yeah. <laughs> so i'll tell you something else very interesting pranav i'll tell you an example I'll give you a different example so policing right you know so wearing a helmet is actually for your own safety right but still a person has to be fined to make that person realize that okay aap aapko aapka jab accident hoga na aapka hi mundi your your uh, you know it will affect your physical self so in india if you find something then only people realize mistakes very interestingly yeah it reminds me of the proverb that uh, most of the people will uh, uh, dig wells only when their houses are set on fire they will not make a uh, smriti you wanted to say something yeah i wanted to say that i think uh, you were mentioning that charity begins at home mm -hmm. and uh, all of us are not there in the front lines like to uh, make a difference to this entire thing so i i feel one of the ways in which we can contribute helping cleaning up the rivers and our environment is using a lot of organic and biodegradable mm -hmm. so even uh, someone was mentioning that a lot of uh, detergents flow into these rivers causing frothing and obviously uh, when these rivers flow through areas with animals who are dependent on them for water for even the fish uh so ultimately everything that we use does go into the rivers and landfills mm -hmm. so the importance of uh, on for everything that we use whether it's a cooking material or whether it's uh, some detergent or a floor cleaner to try and ensure that we are not using any harmful chemicals and they're not even good for us right so uh, uh, with that message uh, thanks a lot uh, smriti uh, with that message we will go to the interesting uh, interesting uh, thing of I, i'll give some examples from the long exhaustive list which i which uh, we just discussed and interestingly you know wildlife uh, uh, reserves and uh, traveling and tourism very interestingly has a very strong citizen science base of it uh, and uh, you know how very interesting i'll tell you so you a lot of people are from this uh, from this uh, you know from our my uh, people who have joined i'm sure visit uh, wildlife reserves go for nature trails and you know go to uh, go to beautiful natural places because that's where we all find peace right and uh, we find the beautiful animals around we find the beautiful birds around so interestingly there are a lot of people who just go enjoy it and come back but you know how the how a small simple act of yours can change radically the whole concept of uh, uh, being in the wildlife reserve so that simple act is to document you know like you document each and every uh, you take photographs mostly people going to wildlife reserve takes photo takes photographs of the animals around and then you can either you know document the photographs you generally people uh, put it on fa uh, facebook and a lot of people can even you know document it and share it with uh, different uh, forest departments or different departments who can use those pictures for their books mm -hmm. or uh, biodiversity to check the biodiversity of that place or every time maybe you know like every time you visit the same place because some people fall in love with the same reserve uh, you know something like i went i've gone to taroba 72 times so just imagine the numbers impact so every time we used to go we used to document just not a tiger or a bird we used to also document how much change has happened in the ecosystem in that same area you know post and after, after the monsoon or maybe due to due to fire in certain sector of the forest whether that fire has extended beyond certain lines what we have observed last time and you know even certain places like where the birds which were plenty at one area is not really showing up that much in the same during the same season at that same area you know so interestingly those those uh, important uh, 
you know, important uh, documentations, you won't believe it how much it helps in terms of checking biodiversity, in terms of checking the surrounding, the ecosystem, or even the issues like, you know, water issues in a, in a tiger reserve. <laughs> and you won't believe it. The best interesting part of this whole citizen science part, or, part is, I'll give you examples from Bandhavgar, Ranthambore. I know my friends from Bandhavgar has also joined it. Each and every tiger in Bandhavgar, Ranthambore, or uh, Corbett, or all these big parks are literally documented, monitored by none other than the tourists themselves, who are also part of a bigger citizen science project. In fact. So each and every, suppose sometimes you see that there is a huge uproar in social media, uh, you know, so a huge uproar in social media saying that, you know what, T1 is missing. So T1 might be one of the main tigers they have been following for at least two years, you know, and then T1 goes missing. You won't believe it. Social media goes bonkers now, I have seen. Mm -hmm. And people exactly know the patterns, which is amazing because, you know, that re requires a real biological uh, certification to really know patterns of tigers. But people nowadays take pictures, know the patterns. Now it has become such that there are a lot of citizen science pictures which are taken for a lot of, uh, you know, scientific research and studies on tigers or different other species which are found in uh, reserves, in fact. And it also contributes to the census to the extent that recent census was challenged by none of them, the citizens of this country saying that the numbers are not right. So just imagine your footprint in when you're going for a tourism in a tiger reserve or any kind of natural habitat, just not tigers, you know, tigers being a flax species and uh, one of my very dear uh, animals, I, I uh, spoke about that. And I think a lot of people, everyone out here loves tigers in fact. So just imagine the impact and the valuable contribution all of you are making. By just uh, doing can this, I you know? add something to this, ma'am? Yeah, 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 please, please do, please do. Yeah, because see, we, it, the slide itself says that we got to report if certain things are not right to that government. Absolutely, absolutely. And what I feel like I travel a lot. I, I'm a person who loves wildlife and travel a lot, a lot. So I go to all the national parks just to understand how things are there. So um, I'm so sorry to tell you that I feel the Tadawa is, is not in a good hands anymore in the sense not in the terms of uh, you know not saving animals but in terms of the amount of tourism goes to Tharoba uh, I literally felt I think it was like I felt like the tiger has been treated not more than a dog I'm sorry if somebody doesn't agree to me no 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 I totally agree Sweta. Sweta I totally <laughs> agree because let me tell you I was coming to that point mm -hmm. so it is just not about documentation of species and your ecosystem also about rowdy tourism what you mm -hmm. exactly are talking about, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. You know, I have myself reported so many times on rowdy tourism where people have been honking in mm -hmm. front of a tiger. Uh, people have gone crazy to the extent where people practically would, you know, not keep even a safe distance from that animal. In fact. That's true. Yeah. I, so, I, you yeah. know, those certain... It's not like, like ma'am... Yeah, not yeah. just the people who are going are misbehaving with the, with the animal. But mm -hmm. the people who are the, 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 the guide who's taking the people inside the taro bar, mm -hmm. uh, they, they follow this, you know, once the tiger is seen by one person, they are on the call. They call the rest of the people mm -hmm. and rest yes, of the vehicles so. just aware, rush towards the animal. <laughs> and I've seen this, this handsome tigeress was struggling hard to move, you know, in between those cars. And I felt I'll tell you to be very frank, I promised myself that I will never go to Taroba after that because I felt my pride of my pride animal has been ill-treated because of this, you know, people who don't understand. I think the authorities know it and still they're continuing because there's a lot of tourism there. Uh, Sweta, can I, can I just correct you uh, a mm -hmm. little bit? Yes, that sure, is, yes, uh, and please call me Dia. <laughs> so, you know, uh, yeah. So, uh, never say no to, no or ignore to certain issues. Mm -hmm. Try and, you know, try document those issues. Like I have done several times of videographing such uh, rowdism. And mm -hmm. 
try at least once or twice to go to the authorities and let them know that this is what you have seen this is what has happened there are mm -hmm. other ways i will give you other ways like you go and mm -hmm. report it to the local media mm -hmm. say this is what is happening so if if the authorities are not you know in tune with you or not uh, respecting your opinion you can definitely go to the media tell them in fact but i would suggest and my re request to all of you that mm -hmm. if you see such issues for the betterment of the park for the betterment of the animal itself whom you mm -hmm. love so much you should take that step you know it is just a small step but that yeah, also counts but i i think it's not a small step no i think that's a great thing i have i personally will never delete that video what i have the way the tiger was moving so wonderful if you please next time and also you know nowadays let me tell you the another very big thing where citizen science can really work is putting such issue level videos on social media where other people are looking into it other people people can even come and uh, just not comment on it or just not say like or anger or dislike but some of the people actually take that up with the right authorities okay you know so you know Thank so you. much so much can be done <laughs> That's so true. anyone anyone else uh, who would like to add to it i i hope i'm not encroaching on your time i would like to add something. something yes 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 please who you should i wait for some no no please go ahead uh, dear uh, you know the reason why i joined up today is because uh, all of us have been totally swept off our feet the way this uh, covid area uh, you know period that we are seeing a uh, uh, regeneration of rivers then there are all these reports of wildlife that have taken over the city or the roads or the highways uh, don't you think we are at a crossroad and you people are, are right there uh, in the front as being activist uh, and taking on issues so what about the uh, there is this whole thing about withdrawal of lockdown and then return to the status of what where we were where we were encroaching not only on spaces but also this whole thing about the environment degradation so isn't this the opportune time for people to form a collective kind of a pressure to really start putting pressure at the, this junction because it's a matter of time when we get back to be, be square one so what are you all doing about uh, it in terms of some kind of an interstate plan or an putting pressure on people who make decisions so it's very interesting that you raise this point uh, and like you have joined joined this uh, webinar uh, with a certain uh, you know thing in thought in mind i decided to decided to uh, hold this webinar because this is the right crossroad where uh, you know we can tell each other that we have much more to do as uh, you know normal citizens uh, citizens of this country towards our ecosystem or rather than just go there and just watch and just be silent you know uh like swetha just rightly said and i also mentioned that to swetha there is much to do there is much even if it is a small thing like documenting certain issues being part of certain campaigns like you know uh, presently one of the very big campaigns that is happening is against the eia the environmental law which is uh, being pushed by uh, the central government to, uh, and being trying to amend it to try to make it more toothless so as citizens we are supposed to oppose certain things which will ultimately impact us in such bad ways that uh, we might not be uh, since we are sometimes short sighted we might not be seeing the impact now but let me tell you in long run we'll be very badly impacted if certain laws like this make are are made toothless or certain dams are cre uh, created in uh you know uh, absolutely uh, amazing biodiversity areas which i'm going to talk after some time so let me tell you this is the right crossroad uh, where we can all even all the people who have joined out here and i know out of out of uh, the people who have joined lot ha lot are all already doing a lot but each each of us have the equal responsibility to hold on to what we have and uh, you know each of, of us have the constitutional responsibility rather i would say so it is just not you know don't don't be, become silent don't fall back and don't think that maybe it is not me who can do some anything in fact maybe i need to be something you know i need to be an environmental lawyer to be to do this or maybe you know i i my contribution is not that much 
absolutely not each and every small contribution even like sweta taking that video and putting it on facebook and making it viral so that authorities look up is also a big contribution so that was my point in making this uh you know statement or uh, doing this webinar all together in fact where every one of us have equal responsibility towards it does that uh, sound good yeah ma'am can i uh, ask you one quick question yeah yeah um, sure. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah thanks nabindu yeah sorry okay i just want to understand uh does the department really think before they amend something because uh, uh there was a issue in maharashtra i believe uh, yeah maharashtra tell what i mean like in maharashtra when there was a huge rally that was taken up in hyderabad i i personally started this one for saving avni oh yeah 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 the tigress <laughs> yeah right right <laughs> right right it right, was the first one with just Wonderful. seven people i started at kbr park and then i did the second session with uh, 150 plus and i did another third session it was about 500 people who have come we did so much but i think at the end of the day our voices were voices were not heard and they did they what what they had to do and today we don't talk about that and we don't know what happened to her cubs uh so there's no that, information ma'am uh, sorry sorry to uh, interrupt you uh, i exactly know this whole of me situation but i don't want to get into the deeper part of it maybe we can take that offline i'll send you my okay, yeah, email sure, id sure. yeah because yeah. that's a very bigger situation but i really have to appreciate and i have to tell all others in this uh, call that what sweta did was also a big contribution towards the society voicing is important and this is actually what citizen science and citizen uh, voice or participatory participatory a conservation ideas could come up to and uh, sweta thanks for what you did but please never never uh, you know never never uh, say that okay this did not happen so i i don't think i have a voice anymore keep doing um, keep doing yeah. it as much as you can you know like uh, as a as a normal citizen we have big responsibility if one uh, uh, of the campaign did not work out does not mean we are going to you know just you know leave it at thought that and just retire we have i'm much, not going to give up today. wonderful very good thank <laughs> you so much in fact this is this is the spirit which is required in fact mm -hmm. for for even if we can uh, you know save even 2% of our ecosystem in fact that if we don't question quality. them there'll be nobody to absolutely, stop them absolutely absolutely let me tell you one quick example before before i get into mm -hmm. a deeper in one quick example is the nh30 uh, nh7 widening inside pench tiger reserve in fact that really destroyed that forest so badly more than 4000 trees were cut out and you know it created a mess in terms of a corridor mapping also where animals used to pass you know cross in fact it's true and there has been an amazing supreme court case we were all part of it but ultimately the government went ahead with it but we could bend certain things where or oh, underpasses were cre created exactly etc et 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 in fact even that small thing really work that does not mean that we are going to leave it there you know okay um, i would just like to uh, yeah yeah sure yeah, just two questions uh, since i believe you are from calcutta uh, yeah. the amazon of the east mm -hmm. government has uh, started i know i know i know <laughs> and second thing is uh, the western guards I know, I know, I know. Even the the Gadgir Commission was uh, totally ignored, and you know what we all know what happened in Kerala. Would you just throw some light on these two issues, please? Yeah. So uh, uh, these are certain issues which are being worked out. Uh, so I'll tell you, I'll tell you about the activism part after some time. Uh, sort of, yeah. if you can hold on. Yeah, like yeah. That. I'm getting into that. Uh, so that's actually very near to my heart. So uh, and uh, I'm not sure whether Meghna has joined the call. So I would. The Western really... Guard thing is something very close to me. That's why I spoke about both. And interestingly, do you know Western Guard? Uh, that portion is one of the most original, most uh, historical yes, yes. biodiversity center in the world. Historical and geology India. point of view. Yeah. Yes, yes, biodiversity center in the world. Yes, so yes. Uh, I'm not sure from. which intelligent idea this is coming in terms of destroying western ghats so whatever so we'll get into that uh, very soon let's hold on to that thought sort of yeah. while we get into a very interesting citizen science activity which happens in this world you know what it is 
I'm sure a lot of you in this uh, group loves birds. Who doesn't love birds? And who doesn't like the, love the colorfulness of the birds, the diversity of the birds? It's mind-boggling, you know. At one point from my balcony, I could see 17 different species. So it is amazing. Birds are amazing, I would say. I'm saying all of the animals are amazing, but birds definitely are, right? And do you know how every one of us can actually contribute to a bigger landscape of birds, documenting birds? So there is this uh, interesting uh, citizen science activity which happens all over the world. It is done by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, that is the Cornell University, and it is called the eBird Network. An eBird Network, exactly, or eBird Daughter, where any person, you, me, who loves birds, or you know, would like to document them, can just hop in, log in, and document or submit your sightings on a regular basis that can be a crow that can be a, a you know that can be a pigeon that can be a dove that can be a, even ibis but all of you actually make hap, do make do happen the world of map of the birds can 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 you all believe that let me show you this is how it happens in fact so this is a typical ebird website uh, this is the ebird.org website and let me tell you, the once you're on it, and once you start being part of eBird website, you know, it's something like Gala, you're part of the largest citizen science project, which documents birds in their respective habitats. With this, I would actually like to call, and do you know what you also do? You actually also track, track you know? So tomorrow, today morning I got up, I saw the ibis. Tomorrow I saw the ibis was making a nest. After two, three months, I see the IBIS has got kids out there. So just imagine, while I'm documenting this, the world is also with me monitoring the nest of the IBIS, the chicks, and the growth of the IBIS kids, uh, chicks, in fact. So just imagine if you are part of such a big citizen science project itself. So with that, that really yeah, help. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think that, that will really help us to even understand how birds are migrating to a different I'm places as well. That. I'm coming yeah. to that. In fact, okay, very I'm sorry. I, no, no, no. Please, please, please. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, uh, the next thing I would like to show is what all of yours effort actually has done. So this is a typical migration route, and I would uh, request Orko. She, he is an amazing citizen scientist who is an avid birder and an expert birder and also a reviewer of uh, ebird.org. Uh, Orko, you're there? Yes. Uh, yeah, hi, Orko. Orko is my colleague, my friend, and uh, also my Gurudev in Guruji in terms of birding. <laughs> so he keeps on correcting me. Orko, I saw this bird. Do you think this is the species or that is the species? So, Arko, can you please uh, enlighten us a bit about uh, e-birding and the migration thing, which I think a lot of people are interested to uh, uh, talk about. Over to you. Uh, this is best done with uh, aid of a presentation. However, I don't have internet on my uh, laptop. I'm doing it from a phone. We had a massive storm and it's actually still rolling on right now. Um, but, uh, but basically, many of you... Uh, are already familiar with it. Uh, it's a platform where birders can come and uh, well, practically anybody can come and uh, upload their data. Um, and uh, you have a detailed protocol uh, built around what data is accepted and how is it accepted. And there's a team of reviewers for each area. It could be a state or it could be a district or it, in, in some cases, in cases of small countries, it could be an entire country. Uh, but uh, but basically, there's a detailed protocol to make sure that the data is, uh, data is uh, appropriate and uh, as far as possible, it is correct. That is one, one of the things with citizen science data that you have to, uh, that, 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 uh, that you have to recognize that the data is not coming from uh, trained scientists um, who are doing a transect or a point count following very detailed protocols. Uh, it's coming from regular people saying that ah, I, I went up on my terrace and I saw this bird. So there has to be some kinds of some kind of check, checks and balances built around 
uh, understanding various biases uh, of people. For for example, you are going to see a, 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 an abundance of species on weekends. You are going to see an abundance of species uh, in winter because you know it's it's more conducive to most of us in this country to go out birding on winter weekends than on a summer weekday. So those kind of balance, uh, those kind of uh, biases needs to be taken into account while you are dealing with eBird data. Uh, but saying that, uh, eBird data has been immensely helpful all over the world, uh, in uh, particularly in the Western countries, in planning um, environmental and ecological, uh, in making environmental and ecological decisions, particularly um, in, in the US. Um, two or three things that I may mention. Um, it, 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 there was a, a large effort in Philippines um, uh, with eBird data to understand distribution of uh, poorly known and rare species. Uh, eBird data was very instrumental in listing red knot as a threatened species. Um, you know that that showed that how rare the world uh, the, the 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 species has become over a period of time. And uh, most interestingly, in California, there was a there was this project called. Uh, the Bird Returns Project, uh, which extensively used eBird data to actually um, uh, uh, create conducive habitat for threatened shorebirds. So I'll just go into a bit of deta detail. I mean, you can look it up on the internet. What happened is that, uh, you know, a large part of Northern California was uh, um, shorebird habitat for long. Uh, and it had marshes and uh, wetlands and so on. And then it got drained uh, because of uh, extensive agriculture. And uh, that shorebird habitat uh, slowly started going away and uh, the birds uh, dwindled. And uh, eventually um, there were very few <clears throat> shorebirds left in that area. Now, US Fish and Wildlife Department, they wanted to um, incentivize the farmers to uh, fill their land with water um, when, when they are not under cultivation uh, so that they can support shorebirds, uh, they can support these waders uh, at the time of their migration. But they did not have enough funds to pay all of these farmers to fill all of their land with water you know, throughout the migratory, migrating season. So what they did was to pick up eBird data, pick up citizen science data, to understand the migration pattern and decide that, well, farmers in this region can fill up their land with water during the first week of April. And farmers slightly south can fill up their land um, with water in the second week of April, depending upon how the birds migrate um, through that area. And there was no way of actually getting that data apart from getting it from regular bird watchers who have birded in that area and put up the data in eBird. So there are several projects like this, and, and this became quite successful. I mean, they were able to incentivize farmers based on that migration pattern to fill up their land periodically with water, you know, for for small uh, amount of time. And, uh, and, and eventually, um, the number of shorebirds in that uh, North Californian region improved significantly. You can, you can look it up on the internet. It's called the Bird Returns Project. There are many projects like this. Uh, the, the main thing is that the data that you're putting in as a, as a eBird user, you may not be able to see the conservation impact of that right away. But once we accumulate the data by a large number of people over a time, then that data eventually five years hence uh, may become of great conservation value. For for example, I have birded in Fulbari Barrage in North Bengal for like you know for for several years, and uh, when I started birding there, I just made lists and put it up on eBird. But now it seems that all the lists that we have put in over a long period of time may help us in saying that okay, so many species are found there, and there is conversion of that uh, grassland going on. There is there there is disturbance. And it may help in, in convincing the authorities that the full body grasslands are important because you know so many birders over a period of time has documented close to 250 species from there. 
So that's all. That, that, was, a, that was a long monologue, uh, but I, I, I hope I, I communicated the importance of uh, Ebert data. To Wonderful. Extent. That was really interesting, Orko. I, uh, any, anyone wants to ask anything to Orko? Because, you know, see how, how much uh, all of you, all of us can contribute. So uh, it is not a small contribution like or Orko just mentioned. Anyone would like to ask Orko anything, in fact? Hello. You can please yes. unmute, unmute and talk. Anyone wants to ask about eBird, and if anyone wants to really get kicked to start something, being be part of the bigger landscape. Hello, hello. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Please, please. Who is this? Uh, this is Deep. Deep Shuraviswas. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Deep. Pretty. How are you doing? I'm good. Tell me. To get to know about. To be honest, real elaborate of an idea about eBirds, but uh, to know how uh, how this like way shows also in a the data that is coming in from the uh, deep your voice is breaking off. Can you uh, can you repeat that please? Hello. Yes. Or perhaps chat box. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, now you're audible deep. Tell yeah, me. so yeah, my internet is a bit. It's... Are this data coming in, feeding in from only photographers or are, like sending out some field survey thinking about a speech? Um, I. Deep. Deep, why don't you uh, write it on the chat box? Yeah, Maybe I think that would be better. Yeah. yeah, 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 because it's very patchy. Sorry. Yeah, Orko, you can read it out, whatever, whatever he wants to ask, maybe. Yeah, but I think the question was, it is, is it only coming from photo? Uh, do we have, okay. Um, yes, actually, there are, there's, a, there's an interesting question. Um, are there other platforms to list other forms of wildlife? Yes, there are. Uh, various platforms that uh, list various types of wildlife. Um, I don't have all of them. Like I don't remember all of them. Of the I think also one right of now, them is, one of them is biodiversity uh, uh, India or something, right? Biodiversity yes. India does that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this this Macaulay Library, and there are a number of platforms. I'll I'll put them on the chat box. Um, birding is uh, by far the most popular nature observation hobby. So eBird is very popular, uh, but there are platforms for other things. Um, so, so there's the question. So essentially, does the input come from only photographers or does researchers also have Yeah, I mean, it can be used. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you several interesting examples. So the question is, uh, does the input come from only photographers or does researchers, um, essentially was trying to ask that whether researchers also provide input. Um, Yes, um, um, I mean, you, if you have a research project and um, you want to like, you know, have a backend to store your data, you can use Bird. Um, and uh, it doesn't have to, uh, like in, you, you, can, you can only use the data that is coming from your sources and keep that separate and don't mix it with the rest of the data. So that, that you can do. And a lot of research projects actually use eBird as a backend. Mm -hmm. uh, one interesting example is Kerala Bird Atlas, uh, where um, you know somehow the eBird users of Kerala um, they are very regimented. I don't know what drives them, but they are very driven and very regimented. And there are some about uh, 500 eBird users of Kerala. They decided to uh, cover um, in great detail each. Um, <laughs> part of the uh, of the state and they divided the state in nine square kilometer grids and subdivided in one square kilometer grids without going into the details they they made sure that the entire state is, is covered uniformly and completely and thus create a bird atlas of what birds are see, uh, seen in what number numbers in what season and they created a bird atlas uh, out of uh, that uh, that study and they used eBird as a backend uh, there was a Mysore bird atlas as well, uh, where they did it just for the city of Mysore. And eventually that data became important for uh, city planning. So for example, 
uh, you have patches of greeneries inside and on the outskirts of city, but you also have development happening. And so you need to build a car park. And so it, it, common sense might say that, okay, so basically there's this patch of greenery right in the middle of the city um, where you have much traffic and all. And you may think that not a lot of biodiversity su survives there. And so you might end up building a car park over there. But if you look at data that is coming from birders uh, over a period of time, uh, then you may realize that, well, that patch of uh, greenery sustains a larger number of species than, let's say, some patch that you would have thought has more species. So Mysore Bird Atlas became uh, quite an interesting project. Kerala Bird Atlas became quite an interesting project. And these are independent projects that used eBird as a backend data. So yes, and data does come from scientists. They to, and some of the data corresponds to specific mm -hmm. research projects as well as well as there's data from bird watchers and photographers. Wonderful, Orko. On that note, uh, uh, you know, I would like to also mention some of the very interesting uh, citizen science successful projects that's out there. One is a fishing cat project. It is part of the uh, fishing cat, a small cat uh, network all over the world. There's the amphibians of India project. There's a Butterflies of India project. They're all based on the same principle as Orgo mentioned in terms of e-birding. There's a Hornbill Watch project, which actually uh, kind of documents, uh, I mean, documentation of Hornbill sightings all over uh, India or all over the world. There's a Wild Canet project, which is very interesting, you know, and they, uh, you uh, kind of document the uh, different foxes and the different uh, jackals, etc. There is a roadkill project, which ultimately the citizens, uh, people who act, uh, documented all the roadkills which they have seen during their travels, uh, those documentation ultimately went to the uh, uh, government of India and certain policies are being uh, now worked on. So just imagine how much contribution uh, of, of each of us, of Pia and Niels, really helps in making even policy level decisions. So these are all citizen science initiative project. If I remember telling you the slender loris project, which happened in Bangalore, that also really helped in understanding what is their ethology, their uh, habitat, and how we can save it from any kind of destruction impact. So interestingly, there are certain grassroots level organizations which are not very scientific research-based organizations like WII, et cetera, who work amazing, does amazing work. And interestingly, I've been uh, personally attached to some of them. Uh, Heal is one, uh, one which is hosting this webinar. They work on, uh, you know, a tribal hunting, which impacts a lot on, a lot on uh, the environment or the ecosystem in South Bengal. And uh, let me tell you, they gather people from all, of, all walks of life. Anyone and everyone like you can join them. Tiger Watch is another organization in Rajasthan. Spore is an organization in North Bengal, which does rescues, which does elephant uh, tracking work. Last Wilderness, uh, I have a lot of my friends uh, from Last Wilderness who has joined. In fact, I'm a very, uh, I've been associated with them quite some time. They do amazing work in Bandavgarh in Kanha, in, with the parties in Panna, and uh, with their, I'm sorry, I might uh, miss few things, but, uh, you know, and let me tell you, uh, all of them are people like you and me. They do marvelous work out there at the grassroots levels. Nature Mates uh, is another organization I'm with. Share is another one, which is from Calcutta. There's news, there is public. I mean, these are just some of the many which work on grassroots level with people like you and me. And each one of us can actually join them, be part of them, be part of their, some of their amazing projects which they do and uh, you know, contribute uh, very well and satisfactorily uh, across in fact. Uh, any, any, anyone want to con uh, ask anything con uh, you know, uh, uh, with regards to them or with regards to uh, the citizen science projects? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, have, I have some question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, they are, I am- Is uh, this Shubhashish? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, said you, you said that WIA is not a scientific uh, based project, no? Uh, no, no, I said it is a scientific based project. Okay, okay, then it's all right. 
Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, because it is uh, related with the uh, uh, public and the uh, uh, conservation relation pro related program, uh, program mm -hmm. I need to say uh, something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is, uh, we need to uh, think about something where the general people can get attached with the conservation work. So these, these are the are, platforms, you know, these are the sub yeah, yeah, yeah. platforms. I know all these are the platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, since I am into this work since uh, long 20 years. Wonderful. Uh, um, the problem is uh, the people, the public, the general public is understanding. But what is happening with us, what we are feeling right now, um, uh, everything uh, we are facing, you said that... Uh, Mm. Migration, migration of birds. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Migration of birds. Uh, Orko said, Orko is a very uh, good friend of mine. Uh, he knows me since long. How many of you have uh, learned about Furadan? Have you ever heard about Furadan? Uh, and is a pesticide. Have you ever heard? No, as I said, Shubhashit, there is so much to learn, so much for us to really... Yeah, yeah. There, is a, there yeah. is a pesticide named Furadan, which mm -hmm. was used in Africa to kill lions. Mm -hmm. To conflict, there was a conflict between the uh, human and the animal. As we all know, human-animal conflict. And there was a pesticide was used uh, named Furadan. Okay. Now this is being used to kill birds, these migratory birds, you know? No, now... We are trying to... We are to, trying, okay. Please tell me. So when you say we, uh, are you saying people who are... Uh, uh, people like us? People like, uh, you know, you, me? Yeah, yeah. People like you and me. Wonderful. See? Are trying to learn about this particular pesticide named Furadan. It has mm -hmm. a very, very short half-life. Okay. You know, everything has a, a half life and it has a very short half life. It uh, disappears into the earth very fast. Mm -hmm. But uh, the thing is happening that this, be, this Furadan is being used to kill migratory, migratory birds in my, my area. That is, I am working with the Faraka and adjoining area. That is an IBA and that has been taken as a uh, migratory birds project by the government of India uh, starting from 2020 and it will be ended up in 2030 for 10 years program that has been taken by government of India. Mm -hmm. In that particular area, that particular pesticide is being used to kill birds. And I have tried to stop that particular pesticide. I Wonderful. went up to the, I, I went up to the uh, agricultural department, the head of the agricultural department, where I gave him all the documents that this particular this particular uh, pesticide is being used to well, actually uh, it was used to uh, kill uh, lions in Africa. He was okay. at that moment. Okay. Thank you so much, Shubhashi. I think uh, all of all of us really appreciate what you are doing. And all of, you, all of us can learn that even in small ways, even if we are not, uh, you know, certified or trained professionals in wildlife or uh, conservation, we can still contribute in our own ways. Is that true? Yeah, that is yes, true. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely okay. that is true. Definitely so, that I, is true. so coming to that, I will uh, tell about a bit of my experience now with an sure, amazing, no. amazing project which... Uh, you know, I was part of, I was very fortunate and uh, uh, I've been proudly part of called the Mumbaikers for ASGNP. And so the bit paradox is that I'm not a Mumbaiker. <laughs> I was never a Mumbaiker actually. So I've never lived in Bombay. But I think I was the only non-Mumbaiker in the Mumbaikers project. And this Mumbaikers project, as you can see from the, uh, is a participatory conflict management project in the Borivili National Park in uh, Bombay. And as you can see, it is to do with the leopard. And uh, you uh, might be aware of Bombay as the most, one of the most congested places. And now we hear about Bombay, sadly, for wrong reasons of very high spike of COVID cases. But Bombay has an amazing, amazing, let me tell you, a breather 
called the Borivili National Park or the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. And uh, uh, the whole project, Mumbaikas for SGNP, was started by uh, uh, field director Sunil Lemay and uh, one of the, the, the leopard lady, Mr. Uh, Vidya Athriya. She is one of the uh, the uh, one of the very known leopard expert in the world. In fact, so this project is very close to my heart because I was part of it, and I have few friends in this group is who has been also part of it. In fact, so this this is a project where actually a lot in terms of a combination of researchers, biologists, and citizens have come together and really made it happen. So that is one reason why I wanted to mention this and my experiences with it. With that, I will show you a very interesting video. I'm sure a lot of people of you might have seen this video, but let me see. If... I'm sorry, but can I ask one thing? Yeah, yeah, sure. Tell me. Uh, when we are working in a project related to wildlife and if even if our uh, profession is something else, so what is the duration of uh, the project? How long, how long do they last? That means the uh, documentation. I mean, about one so or two months. So generally, the Mumbai Cast project was the first uh, first phase for, was for one year. And the next phase, uh, it still continues, actually. You know, it is not, okay. nothing has stopped. But it depends on how much, uh, you know, time and how much of effort you can give it to that. So okay. like I used to uh, do a lot of documentation from Hyderabad itself, where I was placed at that point. But every yeah. weekend, I used to go to Bombay and, you know, be part of the bigger teamwork, in fact. So that, that's how you can do it. In fact, there's a lot of contributions. You can be part of a social media aspect of the project. You can be part of the, you know, uh, a part of a campaign of the project. You can be okay. part of the, uh, the local, uh, uh, local awareness part of the project. So there are certain many aspects of a bigger project like Mumbai Kas, where any person like me and you can contribute. Okay. So I'll show you, all, all of you show you a very interesting video, which I think triggered a lot of interesting thoughts and triggered uh, uh, the project itself. I mean, just not this video, but so this is in Bombay, okay? Hope all of you can see the video. Yes. If you want, I'll run it again because it's very interesting. So as you can see, that's a leopard. And that's one of leopard's most uh, favored prey. That's a street dog, in fact. And as you can see, the video is, happens to be in a... Uh, one of the apartment areas in Bombay, in fact, and that apartment area uh, is near to Borivili. It overlooks the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. There are a lot of apart apartments and complexes around. So the, you know, as, as congested as Bombay is. And uh, so the project triggered uh, uh, with the whole thought of reducing, uh, you know, deaths or accidents uh, by leopards which was, uh, uh, you know, naturally found in that habitat. And there was obviously a lot of encroaching of the forest itself. So obviously that was creating the conflict. So the conflict was obviously created by humans itself because we had gone and encroached their areas. And uh, uh, so it was very easy for the leopard, interestingly, to adapt to that changed environment where now he could pick up dogs uh, so maybe uh, about 10, 10 years from, before, he was picking up dogs from the uh, surrounding uh, jungle areas. Now he adapted himself after the buildings came up and the dogs were staying inside the buildings to come and pick up the dogs from inside the buildings. So just imagine the adaptive nature of this animal itself. So the uh, animal had uh, accepted the change surrounding and had started to live and coexist with us. Excuse me? Hello? Yeah. Uh, hello, Ranjita, can you be on mute, please? Hello? Yeah, so, you know, uh, so very interestingly, 
we had changed their whole landscape right there was a jungle now it were all urban urban uh, buildings he had adapted his life in and around uh, that uh, landscape where he, there was hardly any uh, appearance of him during the days in the mornings you could hardly see a leopard at night uh, uh, when the when the city was sleeping they were around to uh, you know get their prey so he had adapted the animal had adapt, adapted to the, the uh, change in their drastic change in the surrounding but interestingly we could not you know humans could not adapt to, to adapt to that drastic change uh, the sighting of leopards or leopards inside uh, uh, the buildings or uh, leopards taking away the dogs or suddenly sighting a leopard and we would all shout at that point before the starting of the project saying that uh, you know telling the forest department ye aapka leopard hai aap leke jao ye uh, ye leopard ye na aap ek kaam karo you know these are the certain dialogues which used to happen where you know ye uh, jo boundary hai wall hai na ye thoda uncha kar do so that leopards do not come but how do you block an animal where which which had its original uh, you know ecosystem around the same place where now we are living in his uh, house in fact so that's when that's what triggered the project and there were a lot of obviously accidents which were happening because of sudden at night you know uh, a person going for going outside and being uh, sometimes attacked etc and uh, trapping or trapping and re randomly releasing also contributed to it so that triggered the project and interestingly that this project had morning walkers sanjay gandhi national park residents uh film personalities because the film studio happens to be at the other end of the sanjay gandhi national park which is on the ara side ara colony residents in the the uh, the even the bastis around that the police local politicians administrations they were all part of the bigger map of contributing to this project so the contributions happened from making them aware being aware and even the residents at one point started uh, you know forming small groups and making others aware that this is how the leopards uh, you know behave or this is how the leopards move around sanjay gandhi national park so basic do's and don'ts you know at night do not go out or uh, make it sure the kid is not alone because it is that practically the goal was to accept the fact that the leopards are there and we have to coexist with them in fact so uh, and it is one of the most successful projects till date the rate of uh, attacks have come down and uh, the awareness still con continues the work still continues and there was also soft science to part of it where there were researchers and scientists who were who had uh, researched on the uh, prey base in terms of the dogs around and uh, uh, also you know the prey base uh, the leopard sensors also happened in terms of understanding what is the density of the leopards around so there were camera traps uh, which were set in by the scientists together with this the whole uh, community i would say community the bigger community or the stakeholder community came together to solve the basic problem of coexistence you know where the animal had adapted to exist with the humans where the humans had to take one step to adapt to stay with the animal around in fact So does that sound interesting i i i'm still very so kicked about this project it's so near to my heart and it is just such a passionate project in fact where people like you and me actually yeah. solved a very big problem of uh, of the city in fact so um now oh, any questions yeah yeah please any questions yeah actually i would like to add something um, yeah yeah who is this if that's okay uh this is sakshi so i'm basically oh, from nasik yeah hi, hello hi. everyone hi. um so the thing is you know uh, leopards have ad adapted themselves in our territory mm -hmm. but uh, we we are still finding it very hard to adapt with them Absolutely. so the thing that you know most people expect is you know when some leopard comes into our territory that you know obvious reaction is you know uh, set up trap cages you know get them out and relocate them mm -hmm. but what people fail to understand here i think is you know under such, such circumstances when you want to relocate a leopard you are actually inviting some other leopards that are you know nearby to Wonderful. take over the territory perfect perfect yeah, so because you know leopards have their territory so you know when you are trying to remove one from it 
there will be two or more of few ones that would be you know coming towards the territory so you know you're not actually minimizing the problem but actually creating one absolutely so, you know, that's absolutely. the thing good that you said uh, you know keep in mind and you know you yeah. know uh, just to add to sakshi's point you're not even creating one you're also uh, you know kind of inviting more attacks and trouble because because in the process of trapping the leopards become very stressed out and if a leopard is uh, uh, thrown into some very unknown territory that leopard is totally lost so uh, you know yeah so the attacks actually go up very fast you know the the number of attacks actually rise up a lot right? i'm one and, more thing i have a couple of questions add. yeah yeah sure sure please uh, i think it's also important that we need to keep uh, the and the national park very clean because oh yes the dumping part of it yeah absolutely. yes because what happens is the stray dogs they are attracted towards the waste uh, domesticated pigs are att attracted towards the waste and those are easy prey for the leopards so absolutely you know, uh, the he doesn't take the effort of going on for natural prey and hence he steps out uh, very frequently outside the jungle into the city area I and mean, i won't say that these are, those are urban areas that was the jungle before but now which is the urban sprawl uh, in and around a uh, nearby uh, sgn so can i can i add a bit to that you know it is not an addition it is a small uh, uh, rectification from the scientific theory so yeah. there is there is nothing called strain so uh, in india uh, if you think of a indian landscape how much of forest do we have i think it is less than uh, i think less than 30% right so if we consider only the forest areas do you think we could save the different big cats we have like the tigers and the leopards so let we have to accept the fact that in terms of our habitat which is outside forest areas there is a good amount of urban wildlife which is which includes tigers and leopards because uh, there are a lot of tigers which are outside protected areas uh, which just adapt themselves towards their Uh, uh, human habitat sound surroundings and live there. Mm, so yeah, there is know, the stray know. word is very uh, very delicate. In fact, in fact, but uh, the stray word is not something which maybe we should avoid. It is not stray because you can't expect that in such a small area of the protected areas. And frankly, uh, if you think of it, the leopard doesn't know that is a protected area boundary, right? so that that leopard will come uh, will uh, go around any place where it thinks it can safely live and can safely eat its own prey so it is not actually yeah. stray it is yeah. it is of mm. uh, you know adapting to different mm. ecosystems uh, because as the population also grows in terms of these cats yes, yes. you have to understand that each and every cat cannot live in the same territory right because they no, don't actually, have a, they don't have an apartment system like us you know yeah, where no, the first actually, floor where second floor my point my, uh, my point specifically was that if you keep the uh, nearby area clean mm -hmm. then it would not attract uh, dogs and pigs absolutely so yeah. interestingly interestingly you know in our research in our project we actually found that one of the very big trouble was that you know the dumping uh, uh, grounds Uh, around the civic areas was attracting yes. the dogs and that was attracting the leopards in a typical yes. uh, typical food chain manner so and also open chain, defecation right? by children oh yes 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 absolutely you are right because i actually didn't want to get too much in details into the yeah. project because that might become boring but yes, there is yes. an extensive study an extensive report by all of us uh, yeah. in terms of this project itself yeah I, I, I would like to add something, ma'am. Slightly uh, different thing yeah. than what we are discussing. Sure. I strongly feel that there should be very strict laws against illegal constructions and uh, development <laughs> yeah. inside the protected areas. Pranav, I feel that Pranav, the, that is I, the that sorry that is the thing causing increasing the conflicts between. So, Pranav, you being a citizen uh, sci scientist something. and. Yeah. Uh, and a responsible citizen why don't you take this up as a project because you no, know that will be a great thing to do sure may i, may I tell you something yeah shobha sir uh, mr pranav uh, wildlife outside the yeah, protected yes, area have you ever read about that wildlife outside the protected area not specifically as you are suggesting no, it so, has gone to it so that is what we were talking about so uh, 
so it is called the wildlife wild, just not wildlife animals around uh, about uh, outside protected areas so like i said that we do not have so many protected areas to uh, you know uh, kind of uh, have the capacity to uh, bear no, all the yeah, yeah. increasing may I, population yeah thank you may i introduce yes, yes shubhash if if someone builds a nest okay. or a house or a building or a flat inside a elephant's corridor what will happen yes rightly said pranav this is the no, question may, i am asking may. you that will i may say if something a, if you build a, if you build if you build if you build a housing inside Hello. a leopard's area what will happen the rate of conflicts will may increase I, the leopard will pose a threat not only to the residents and uh, and also to the domestic animals so the thing happened in mumbai the residence was built in the leopard's area Exactly. Now, how you you will answer this? No one can answer, Shubhashi. I think we answered uh, in the project itself, and uh, uh, I can uh, you know uh, there is a Mumbai Cars uh, video which I could not show show because it's a very extensive video. Uh, anyone can Google uh, on YouTube about the project itself. It's called the Mumbai Cars for SGNP, uh, and it's an extensive pro uh, video where you can go, uh, find it on YouTube and see how. things changed from uh, worse to better it, yeah and uh, you know it got adapted coming to that i think uh, we are crossing a lot uh, i mean it's it's very interesting i really don't want to leave uh, this webinar because it's so interesting ideas coming in so the other citizen science which i wanted to mention and very interestingly it uh, coincides with uh, the cyclone which just hit uh, bengal is wildlife rescues you know rescues itself and uh, i wish my very good friend who is uh, featured in, in this picture could have joined uh, shubhro uh, and uh, there are other people also uh, very good friends like um, you know uh, shama and orko prabhu are you there orko prabhu are you there hello hello orko prabhu are you there okay so i'll tell you a bit about wildlife rescue so during such calamity yes, especially yes. orko babu you are there yes ma'am yes dear dear okay so interestingly yes. orko babu happens to be a wildlife rescuer he is like you and me so he is not not any he is not certified or trained in wildlife but he has been a wildlife rescuer from the age of 14 so it is absolutely appreciable orko babu you want to talk a bit about wildlife rescues in the do's and don'ts how to be careful orko over to you quickly can you cover a bit about wildlife rescue orko you there hello hello sorry we are having a lot of issues with the net i think orko babu you there okay i'll only tell a bit about the wildlife rescues in fact so uh when such calamities actually strike us just imagine the birds such imagine the uh you know the snakes just imagine the even the mongooses like we see in fact they sometimes uh, get uh, they sometimes come inside houses because uh, for shelter in fact so how do you manage them you know you cannot live with them you cannot discard them and you should definitely not kill them because many of our many of the species are protected by the wildlife protection act of 1972 and uh, some of them are scheduled one species like the dolphin is a uh, gangetic dolphin is a scheduled one species in fact so what do you do with them so there are certain wildlife rescue organizations across india like ifa wa is one of them and uh, many of them actually do a train wildlife rescue of uh, officials and the most important is either you get a hold of their uh, numbers or their uh, you know their uh, their contacts or you uh, uh, definitely call up the forest department around uh, who will help you in terms of uh, how to handle that animal for that time and the most important part the most important part in wildlife rescue used to be 
is to be very careful and not to be very uh, you know very very uh, brave or go and touch it cuddle it remember it is still a wild right it is not habituated to human touch it is not habituated to uh, much of human presence so it is going to bite it is going to uh, attack if you are trying to approach it in much uncomfortable distance in fact right so it's always good to have a fear of wild animals because that will help you to save yourself as well as the animal because in all of the uh, all of the rescue times if you be, uh, try to take a selfie or you know try to uh, you know um, be too cozy with the wild animal it will is going to definitely attack because uh, interestingly i have a very funny belief in my life that the only animal which is very offensive and not uh, offensive is humans other than that all are all are very defensive animals so if uh, if any animal even a snake is cornered will actually attack you but if a snake is left uh, left and is let to go in its own way it's not going to harm you in any way in fact so uh, anyone wants to contribute anything on wildlife rescues yeah actually i would like to contribute if that's okay um this? hello Yeah. Uh, this is Sakshi. Oh, hi, Sakshi. Yeah. Yeah. Please. So, hi. Mm. So, yeah. You know, talking about wildlife rescues, the thing that you know actually becomes a problem is you know mob control. Uh, oh yes. So you know, yeah. So you know, whenever if there's a you know something like you know, be it a snake, be it a raptor, or any bird or any animal. So you know, people are triggered. They are curious. You know, everybody wants to take pictures for their you know WhatsApp, social media. Oh yeah. So at that. that's why i said no selfies no taking pictures because the yeah. animal is already stressed out remember that so it is a so, wild animal plus it's stressed out so it's quite a lethal combination right so it's best exactly. to them, best to respect them and you know see in a way if you talk about urban wildlife and you know you are not something into wild but you know you want to contribute so one way you can do is you know by mob controlling you know tell people to stay away you know and uh, maintain their boundaries and uh pick up a call you know call somebody who's very professional who's been working into this so i guess that is a better way to do it you know rather than taking the matter in your own hands if you Absolutely. don't have any knowledge about it in fact uh, in fact that's why i will reiterate this point do not take any any uh, matter in your hand at all if you see a snake or a mongoose uh, very near inside your house near to your house uh which which is which might be a bit threatening to the animal as well as you best is to stay away call the right authorities like the forest department or your nearby rescue uh, ngos and make it sure like sakshi rightly said that people are away and don't get cozy with the animal because you know they are already stressed out they are out of their own habitat they are not very comfortable when it comes to that in fact so if they bite you do not blame uh, you know you cannot blame them frankly right yeah exactly and you know talking about uh, you know in a way like if you see a bird that is you know hurt in a storm and everything uh, i guess you know keeping the bird in a isolated uh, place be it a box or you know if it's dark that helps a bird to calm down a lot you know unless you know until you hand it to some professional bird rehabilitator absolutely i would suggest you know keeping it in a box or a dark place isolated and in case there comes a situation where you know uh, it's a raptor so do not attempt it by your own but you know it will be good you know if you know it's dark so that tries you know that helps uh, you know to keep animal maintain its utmost calm and you know the situation won't get out of hand so you know this is something we should keep in our mind wonderful thank you sakshi for uh, saying what you just said and uh, i uh, as i said this is what really needs to be uh, followed in fact because it is a- after all a wild animal and it is not habituated to humans around in fact thank you thank you so much thank you so much saying that i will quickly come to a uh, a discussion which we were having some time back by i think saurav or someone who was talking about activism uh and especially how uh, our environment ecosystem are uh, you know very categorically being destroyed and especially recently um uh, are you there in the call now sort of or sorry i may, maybe missed your name yeah i am there i am there oh wonderful so you were asking about activism which is very near to my heart in fact i have done 
many activisms in my life <laughs> uh, to the woe of a lot of people. So this is a recent, uh, you know, this is a recent uh, campaign that is happening. So Dehing Pat Patkai is in uh, Assam, in fact, and uh, it's in Dibrugarh, and it is, uh, you know, it is a kind of a, a coal mining which has been proposed by the uh, erstwhile government of ours, which is to our sadness. And uh, this is one, and the other which is doing rounds is Dibang Valley, and it is an amazing ecosystem. If you call, ask me. It's got the best biodiversity. It's got more than eight, nine different cats altogether in Debang Valley. It has been categorically proposed to propose for a thermal power plant. So we uh, increasingly had such major concerns. May it be sand mining, may it be coal mining, might be uh, road widening, might be uh, such biodiversity destructions like this. So the first and foremost thing each and every citizen of this country just not the people who are with us today we are together can do but every person should do is one how you can do okay i'll tell you certain things one is maybe write to the authorities second is find more about the subject from social media platforms from websites from many different sources thirdly let me tell you there are groups everywhere for such issues who actually fight to the T in terms of such issues, get in touch with them and you can you put your signature, you can put your uh, footprint, you can put your words into the, into the campaign itself. Thirdly, if you're uh, bolder enough over and above that, you actually can do a petition. And seriously speaking, people like me and you, everyone can actually protest and make a petition, it can go up to the Supreme Court petition or a High Court petition, take a stay order, and, uh, involve lawyers, involve env environmentalists, involve scientists who are all part of this biodiversity. And let me tell you, it is a wide uh, open world. They will all love it and they will all respect you. They will all help you with that. So yeah, you, have, uh, you wanted to uh, talk about it. Yes. Uh... Ma'am, I just want to know what is the situation right now? Have they started uh, with the coal mining there or? Uh... No, so there is a, so there are a lot of clearances that actually have to be taken uh, all in all for any kind of uh, uh, destruction of biodiversity in this country. Thank God our laws are pretty cool, very good. Our laws are very strict, but uh, you know, a lot of laws can also be bent as you know. So, uh, but there are ways and uh, ways where we can also bend the laws towards our side. So at this point, uh, are you talking about the Western Ghat part or the Dibang Valley? Uh, the project? Dibang Valley because... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dibang Valley... A, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Dibang Valley, what actually went a bit wrong was uh, the, there was an assessment w, uh, done by WII. And interestingly, WII, okay. WII has a give, given a green signal uh, which, is, which came as a shock to everyone in the WII has country. given it a green signal? Yes which has come to a shock to this country. Uh, WIA said that, okay, you know, we can manage with the diversity types. I have, I have something to tell. Regarding yes, this, I have something to tell. Yes. May I? Yes, please. Uh, actually, uh, regarding dolphins, you were talking about. No, we are talking. No, we are not talking. No, we are not, we are not talking about dolphins. Uh, actually, we are talking about. about dolphins. Yeah, we are talking about. about dolphins. No, so we are talking about Dibang. Uh, no, no. Actually, we, right now we, we are talking about Dibang. Let yeah. me so explain we, the whole thing. No, can we talk? Uh, can we wrap up Dibang, then talk about the dolphins? Okay, you just uh, finalize, then uh, hand over the mic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's interesting news. Uh, I'm sure, like it is shocking for you, uh, sort of. It is. It was shocking for every one of us. And uh, so, what is happening is we are trying to. Uh, put up uh, strong petitions to MOEF. We are trying to uh, work out through different uh, legal uh, petitions and we are also yeah, yeah. trying to harness a lot of local, uh, you know, local support. Uh, support. Yeah, because let me tell you, there are a lot of projects in my lifetime of wildlife. I have seen where the local support has, have actually killed uh, even the inception of destruction because the locals are the biggest supporters of the wild of the biodiversity because they live there yes, so yes. we are trying to harness a lot of local support 
Any and, petition uh, filed before the court regarding Devang Valley? Uh, not yet. There is certain things going on. It is uh, still under under a planning. In fact, so uh, we will we can keep updating you. What we can what you can do is for the interest part of it, you can follow certain campaigns which uh, uh, we are doing on Devang Valley. In fact, one is conservation India campaign. Sorry. Uh, will you be sharing the updates about Dimang Valley uh, in here? Uh, so why don't I sh uh, give a... So this is uh, uh, Dimang Valley, uh, which is happening. The uh, whole campaign is, uh, has taken a big course with conservation. Because conservationindia.org. So this is a... Uh, okay. this, is a this is a... Uh, uh, this is a web. Uh, this is a kind of a portal where conservation issues are discussed, updated, campaigns are run. So that's where uh, you all can follow the Dibang Valley campaign that is happening. And uh, and let us all hope and pray that whatever we small we have in terms of the of biodiversity in India is not yes. categorically destroyed here, and especially not in times when the nature is giving back. Light, right and left to us, but we still do not have an understanding of it. That's, and I would say, your situation. Is that our mining minister is also our environmental minister, so I don't know. <laughs> what is, what will be so, done. so, you know where it is coming from, right? Yes. Is there have any copy <laughs> regarding Divang Valley uh, government issues, green signal in Divang Valley? WII. WII. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so if you uh, just Google Devang Valley, you will see all of the literature and even the media reports which have come up in terms of uh, this uh, thing which is going wrong. And the one which, is, which I'm showing is another campaign, which is again Northeast. So I think they are, uh, you know, they are absolutely hell-bent on uh, destroying Northeast, which is, uh, which is, I think, all that is left of our diversity of this country and the Western Ghats. So they're just after it, I would say. In fact, so yeah, types. In fact, and let me tell you, all of us, all of us, categorically can help in this campaign. Give your signatures. Make this campaign go viral in your uh, Facebook post, your social media links, and make it sure that uh, you know the government gets up and realizes the fact that you know just not handful of people like us is only protesting. Everyone is doing it in, in, it, in fact. So that is one of the biggest citizen science that can, not science, I, partic participatory uh, thing which can, we can do to stop certain, uh, you know, very, very uh, negative impacts in, in this country, in fact. So um, saying that, I would uh, actually like to con conclude because I think we have gone beyond a lot of time, but it was seriously very interesting for me, in fact. And uh, saying that, I would uh, one uh, appeal I have, I don't know how many of my wildlife friends are still around with us, but one appeal I have for all of them, whoever is around, that is, please open your doors, uh, you all you wildlife biologists, your researchers, and let people like me, people like everyone who has, some of them who have joined the call, to come and voice their concerns, participate in citizen science, be part a part of eBird network. Uh, talk about tourism issues, and uh, you know, make uh, good use of social media rather than just maybe putting selfies. Uh, uh, not that I have anything against selfies. Please don't take me wrong. But please go ahead and put selfies. But also, you know, you can put uh, uh, interesting issues also, which actually make uh, make it viral. And actually, can you beat it? There are a lot of campaigns which are which are uh, on social media, which have helped the government, uh, which have pushed the government to take a decision otherwise. Can you, I, I, I don't know whether you'll believe it, but let me tell you, I've been part of many of such. One being, one being uh, the Amul Falcon uh, campaign, which was started by one of my very good friends. So there was indiscriminate hunting in Nagaland of the Amul Falcons, where the whole migratory population was being decimated. And a strong social media campaign together with the uh, on-ground campaign with the locals actually stopped it, in fact. So, you know, every one of us are so valuable in terms of saving our ecosystem. 
that's all I have to say. And uh, anything else? Anything else? Uh, oh, okay. So the, just a small thing in all of this. Uh, just to just to remember that since wildlife and ecosystem is a very sensitive area and topic, we just need to be very careful that uh, there is certain frameworks uh, uh, on which we should be working. You know, some do's and don'ts. Like you know, like Sakshi said. Uh, you know, in terms of a passionate wildlife rescue. Do not go and fondle the animal and take selfies. So, you know, there's certain do's and don'ts we need to respect, in fact, and keep a distance. That's very important uh, because it's going to harm you, in fact. So, you know, other than that, please have a great time. Please, you know, join all of us. Thank you so much. Every word of yours can help to save what we have today in this country, in fact. Thank you so much. I had something to tell. Yes, Shubhashish, tell me. Yeah. Uh, you know, the WII has uh, given a green signal to Divang Valley right now. Yeah. It is a very recent thing, you know. Yeah. But do you have any idea that WII has also given, actually not given, actually suppressed the Gharials, actually, uh, Gharials and the uh, Gangetic River Dolphin thing that the survey they made uh, from the stretch of Baranasi to Malda, mm -hmm. they have suppressed the whole thing to promote the water waterway. You know that waterway inland waterways, was, inland yeah, waterways. Yeah, yeah that yeah, was I'm proposed by that was proposed by the central govern, government right now. The whole thing they have done, they have suppressed, they have not given the exact numbers, they have not given the exact scenario. Do you have any idea? It was far, far, far before than the Dibang Valley thing. Yes, I'm aware of it, Shubhashish. We are presently from Heal working on a dolphin project, a dolphin issue itself which have, happens to be in the Faraka, uh, Faraka area. But at this yeah, point, I, I'm I sorry. Okay, I, at this point, Shubashi, I won't be able to tell much about it because we are still uh, under a certain, uh, we are doing a certain investigation. No, no, I am not telling about that thing. Mm -hmm. I know the whole thing. I'm aware yeah. of the WII thing also. Uh, yeah, 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 that's what I am telling. Right, right. So don't, right, right. don't rely on WII. I know, absolutely We are funded not. by the central government. Absolutely. So, uh, and any questions, uh, any one of you have questions? Yeah, yeah, let me tell you, uh, 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 thanks for, uh, thanks for this, uh, thanks for really joining in this session and thanks for really contributing in so different ways. I hope I could uh, make the point of how all of us together can make a difference. And I hope uh, all of us, all of you will join the gang sometime and uh, be part of the wild wildlife gang itself. So, uh, anything else anyone would like to say? Please, uh, you know, unmute and say because uh, anything you would like to ask, let me see in the chat. Chat, yeah. Thanks, Gomti. Yeah, thanks to everyone, in fact. It was, let me tell you, it was a big fun for, for me, in fact, because so much to learn, so much to learn from each other, so much to talk about. So um, with that, uh, should we say a goodbye now or anyone else has any questions? Why WII does such things? So as Shubhash has just mentioned, it is a, a government organization. It also comes under a lot of pressure from the central government. And as you know how it is when it comes to the central government, right? So, uh, you know, maybe we should, we are actually asking WII why it is coming under so much pressure, in fact. <laughs> yeah, so any other questions? Uh, any other questions? Wildlife rescues, uh, find out from your local uh, teams. There will be certain local teams like the snake. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the very important uh, snake rescue team is in Hyderabad from the Friends of Snake who do snake rescues. Or if you do not find any local uh, wildlife rescue teams, I would suggest 
try to get in touch with the local forest department to begin with. Uh, so that's one. And uh, anything else? Um, mm -hmm. Any questions? Any questions? Thanks, Deep. Thank you very much. Any any other questions? Anyone has any questions? If not, that I would uh, wrap off. Thanks so much for joining. All of, all. Uh, I hope to see all of you in somewhere in my path in wildlife. And uh, let us all be very responsible citizens of this country and save whatever we have close uh, close to our heart. Thank you, Nabindu. And uh, saying that, uh, I would also like to mention that. Uh, Day after tomorrow, we have a, a very interesting talk with our fishing cat lady, Priyasha Addo. And she happens to be a president award winner uh, for her great contribution towards the species called uh, the fishing cat. And it also happens to be a fishing cat Friday. So please tune in and join in. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Orko. Orko, do, would, would you like to wrap up? Everything done? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care, all of you. Have a safe time. Bye.